Within 65 years, Ephraim will, will be too shattered to be a people. The chief city of Ephraim is Samir, Samir, Samaria. And the chief of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. The Lord spoke again to Ahaz. Ask for a sign from the Lord your God. It can be as deep as Sheol for, or as high as, the, as heaven. But Ahaz replied, I will not ask, I will not test the Lord. Isaiah said, Listen, house of David, is it not enough for you to try, to try the patience of men? Will you also try the patience of my God? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and name him Emmanuel. By the time he learns to reject what is bad and choose what is good, he will, he will be eating curds and honey. For before the boy knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. The Lord will bring on you, your people, and your father's house, such a time as has never been since Ephraim separated from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. On that day, the Lord will whistle to flies at the farthest streams of the Nile and to bees in the land of Assyria. All of them will come and settle in the steep ravens, in the clefts of the rocks, in all the thorn bushes and in all the water holes. On that day, the Lord will use a razor hide from beyond the Euphrates River, the king of Assyria, to shave the hair on your heads, the hair on your legs, and even your, your beards. On that day, a man will rise, a young cow and two sheep, and from the abundant milk they give, he will eat curds. For every saviour, survivor in the land will eat curds and honey. And on that day, every place where there were a thousand vines worth a thousand pieces of silver will become thorns and briars. A man will go there with, with bow and arrows because the whole land will be thorns and briars. You will not go to, to all the hills that were, that were once tilled with a hoe. For fear of the thorns and briars, those hills will be placed for oxen to graze and the sheep to trample. Thanks, Tessie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's pray together. Father God, thanks so much that we can read your word together this morning, that uh, we have that great privilege to know who you are as you have shown yourself uh, in the Bible. We pray as we look at this passage together now that you might help us to know uh, how to rightly respond to it, uh, how to live in faithful obedience. And Father, cause us to love and adore the Lord Jesus more. Amen. And now if you're an um, Australian history buff one of the three in the world. Um, uh, there's been a, a bit of a ruckus in the past few weeks. Uh, is a collection of letters called the Palace Letters that have uh, been released to the public. Um, there are a collection of letters that were sent between um, the Governor General of Australia in the 70s, John Kerr, and Buckingham Palace. And if you do know your Australian history, uh, John Kerr was the Governor General who kicked out Prime Minister Gough Whitlam of his office in 1975. Um, and, and these letters give us a bit of an insight into what happened to cause such a big use of power. Now, there can be many different thoughts on what that means in this room, um, but it did raise the question of uh, who should be in charge of Australia? Should it be the monarch of England? Should it be an Australian? Should it be a New Zealander? No one thought the last one, but it did raise that question. Who should be in, a, in charge of Australia? A, a similar question here is posed to King Ahaz. Who is in charge? A, and more so, who is the best person, the person best suited to be in charge? Uh, last week, Stu unpacked Isaiah 6 with us. Uh, and we see Isaiah being called as a prophet. And uh, in Isaiah 7, we see him go on his maiden voyage. 
to prophesy and to speak to the worried King Ahaz. Um, I'm going to be off script this morning. It's going to go for two points. Um, I know, crazy, right? Uh, first one is who's in charge? And second, the wrong and the right king. Um, so our first point is but the question of who is in charge. And it's obvious and kind of easy to say, but uh, each of us is the one who decides who is in charge of our lives. It's the call that we have to make. Um, I want to give a bit of context of what's happening in this passage because there's lots of names and places. So you've got four different countries uh, operating here. So you've got firstly Judah. They're the good guys, relative term. Um, their king is King Ahaz. They live in the land of Judah. Their capital is Jerusalem. They're the nation that's still under God's favour. So Judah's in the south. Then you have Israel in the north. That's when the nation of Israel split. Uh, Israel is sometimes called Ephraim in this passage, and they have a king called Pekah, um, and they live in the capital, Samaria. Um, they used to be part with Judah. They split. These guys aren't under God's favour anymore. Then over the side, there's Syria, pretty much where modern-day Syria is, uh, also called Aram, and the king there is Rezin, and he lives in Damascus, where you can go visit today. And finally, there's the big bad guy, Assyria. We don't really hear much about him, but he's like the big one to watch out for. Um, the plan is that Israel wants to team up with Syria and they want to go to war against Assyria because they're the big bad. They want to get like on the front foot. But Israel and Syria need uh, Judah's help uh, to fight against Assyria. But Judah says no. And this is where we land in chapter 7. Uh, verse 1 says, the two kings went to fight against Jerusalem, but they were unable to conquer it. Israel and Syria were so annoyed that Judah didn't join in that they're going to go fight against Judah itself. And verse 6 give, uh, gives us some insight why. They say, let us go up against Judah, terrorize it and conquer it for ourselves. Then we can install Tabiel's son as king in it. They want to go to Jerusalem, kick out King Ahaz, Kick out's a nice way of saying kill him. Um, and put their own guy, this son of Tabil, as king of Judah, so that then Judah would join the fight and they can go and have a go at Assyria. And rightly so, King Ahaz is terrified. Verse 2 says, uh, The heart of Ahaz and the hearts of his people trembled like trees of a forest shaking in the wind. Uh, the, the passage doesn't give us an insight at the moment as to what King Ahaz's plans are. But God calls Isaiah and his son to go and meet with Ahaz. And he goes with this message. King Ahaz, chill out. God has got this. Uh, God is clear, verse 7. This is what the Lord God says. It will not happen. It will not occur. God gives his firm but gentle word reminding King Ahaz that God is the one who's in control, who knows what's going to happen, and that this plan that northern Israel and Syria have is not going to happen. But then verse 8 and 9 give a, a, fun, like a funny addition to this passage, using some strange imagery. But God uses this kind of strange imagery to remind us and remind Ahaz of who's who. So he doesn't like this. The chief of Aram, that's the, the nation of Syria, is Damascus. So the capital city of uh, Syria is Damascus. Uh, but the chief city of Damascus is Rezin. So some, some Bible translations might have it the, the other way around, but this is what I've got. Um, so it's like saying the chief of Syria is Damascus, the chief of Syria of Damascus is Rezin. So it's like saying that Canberra is the chief of Australia. And then if Canberra is the chief of Australia, the chief of Canberra is ScoMo, or the Queen, depending on what your view is. Um, and the same way he described northern Israel, uh, called Ephraim here. The chief of Ephraim is Samaria. The chief of Samaria is um, the son of Romalia, King Pekah. But what about Judah? The chief of Judah is Jerusalem, and the chief of Jerusalem is 
You were going to say K has, weren't you? No, it's God. Ha ha. God is the king over his people. He always has and always will be. Imagine you jump into an Uber one night, or if you're a bit older, a taxi. Um, I have to look that one up. You jump into an Uber, and behind the front, behind the driver's seat, sorry, behind the wheel, is a nine-year-old. Now, what do you do? Do you just go, you take the risk, you go, okay, surely this is okay. Maybe you just have really bad conflict skills and you just don't want to confront this problem. Or do you say, you know what, no thanks, I'm just going to get another Uber or walk home or do anything but this. You want a competent driver. And, and that's just for that, that such a short time of your life. You think about your life as a whole, isn't it even more important to get it right, to get the right person behind the wheel? These other nations, Israel and Syria, are ruled by men. But Judah is ruled by God. God is calling King Ahaz to stand firm in his faith. Verse 9, if you do not stand firm in your faith, then you will not stand at all. God's call is to put your faith in him, not some human king. God is the one who is eternal, who is everlasting, and who is in control. If you put your faith in him, then you will stand. So the question that God is asking Ahaz is, Who's going to be in charge? Is it going to be God or is it going to be someone else? The question is posed to us too. Who is going to be in charge of your life? Who is in charge of your life right now? It's a question I want you to think about, roll around your head a little bit. Maybe it's you, maybe it's someone you love and trust in your family. Maybe it's not even a person. Maybe it's something a little bit more abstract like, it's your job or your career or your popularity or your success. Who runs your life at the moment? And then ask yourself, how are they going or how is it going at being in charge of my life? Are they getting it right? Do I feel like we're going in a good direction? If they were my Uber driver, how many stars would I give them? As we keep digging through God's word this morning, let's have that question roll around in our heads and we're going to come back to it. King Ahaz, however, we see in this passage, was going to back the wrong horse. And a big chunk of the rest of this chapter, as well as going into chapter 8, is about the consequence of not trusting God as your king. And these consequences are pretty dire. God wants to kind of reaffirm and help Ahaz. And so verse 11, he says, ask for a sign. And Ahaz replies in this kind of very righteous way. I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. Maybe Ahaz is remembering Deuteronomy 6.16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. If this is true, then Ahaz, very astute and very religious man, not wanting to put God to the test. But then Isaiah's response doesn't suggest that. Isaiah says, listen, house of David, is it not enough for you to try the patience of men? Will you also try the patience of my God? I think Ahaz knows that if he sees a sign from God, he'll be convicted to put his faith in God. He'll be convicted to change his mind. He's trying to get out of seeing this sign because he's made up his mind. He knows what he wants to do and he doesn't want to change his mind. Uh, It's not quite clear what he's decided here. We know further down the line in history, he actually teams up with Assyria, the big bad nation, to fight off northern Israel and Syria. That story doesn't go heaps well. Uh, I'm sorry for another time. But in this passage, we know for sure that by Isaiah's response to King Ahaz, that King Ahaz had not chosen to put his faith in God. But despite all this, Isaiah tells him the sign anyway. Uh, Kind of a a nice glimpse into the gracious character of God. 
Isaiah says, see the virgin will conceive, have her son and name him Emmanuel. It goes on to say that before the boy knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. So it's actually quite a nice start that uh, there's going to be a child that is born and by the time that that child get, comes to understand what's good and bad, so you know, quite an early age, uh, the nations of northern Israel and Syria will be no more. There could actually be peace. But Isaiah goes on and says, the Lord will bring on you, your people and your father's house, such a time as never been seen since Ephraim separated from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Started good, now not so good. God is actually going to bring this big, bad nation of Assyria to the doorstep of Judah. The flies and bees of verse 18 and 19 are the Assyrians swarming over Judah. The vineyards worth masses of money will just be thorns. Farms and fields will be trampled by wild oxen and sheep. It's a picture of God's land, God's place, empty of God's people. You might have seen some documentaries of what the world will look like if humans just suddenly disappeared. Uh, where and how the plants would grow, how animals would migrate and kind of take back the land, how long the kind of big buildings that we've built would last. And, and it's a bit like that. Uh, the kind of wilderness takes over the land of God. Uh, but this is the result of not placing your faith in God, of backing the wrong horse. Like, I'm not going to beat around the bush here. It is awful. It's derelict. And, and back to our Uber driver. You get into an Uber, uh, you want someone who knows how to drive a car. If they're driving manual, you want to know that they can change gears. You want someone who has a license, has a decent driving record. And when you jump into an Uber or a taxi, there's kind of an element of trusting the system because you actually don't know the driver. And so for that 10 or 15 minutes, maybe you never thought about it, but you're entrusting your life to that driver. And so again, if you think about your whole life, how much more important is it to entrust it to the right person? Ahaz was backing the wrong horse. For him to go anywhere but God was putting the wrong person behind the wheel. To put anyone else behind the wheel was to put someone who is sinful, someone who doesn't actually have your best interests at heart, someone who actually doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or next year. The consequences are huge. But when we move into Isaiah 8, we see that Isaiah says that God will be his sanctuary, verse 14. But that for both Judah and Israel, for both the north and south nations, God being their sanctuary will be a stumbling block that they will trip over, a snare, a trap. God is being really clear. If you choose the wrong person to put your faith in, to trust your life with, there's going to be disastrous consequences. But there's another problem. Israel's, Israelites can't just turn and go, yep, God, I'm going to follow you faithfully always. There's, there's that option there, but there's this stumbling block. There's something that the Israelites can't get past. And that problem is themselves. Humans in and of themselves can't turn themselves and follow God because the human heart is hard. Not your actual physical heart because you need it to be not hard, but the Bible's understanding of the heart is the place where we love and hate, where we make decisions, where our emotions lie. To put your trust in what the Bible calls faith in God means not having you or someone or something else in charge of your life. But a hard heart can't do that. A hard heart wants you in charge. It's selfish and prideful. So we're kind of at this impasse. Where does Israel go from here? And where do we go? 
Well, we go to the place where hearts can be changed and where grace can be found. We have to go to the cross. We've seen a glimpse of Jesus already uh, in this Emmanuel promise, which, we, um, which comes up quite a lot at Christmas time. Um, but in the context of what's happening in the passage, um, this promise isn't just speaking of Jesus. Uh, it's speaking of someone a bit more immediate. Uh, at the beginning of chapter 8, um, we see a child is born. Uh, and uh, it says that before the boy knows how to call father or mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoils of Samaria will be carried off to the king of Assyria. So there's kind of this parallel kind of similarity between this promise here of this child that's born and the promise of uh, Emmanuel, that uh, before knowing good or bad, before being able to call his mum, mum, and his dad, dad, um, Syria and um, northern Israel will be gone. And so I think in the immediate context, we're um, looking at the son of Ahaz, which is the king um, Hezekiah. And there's fulfillment that they're like the northern nation of Israel is carried off by Assyria. Uh, and so we see some fulfillment there. But then when we jump to the New Testament, Matthew in his gospel picks up and expands on this promise in Matthew 1. Uh, the angel comes to Joseph uh, to tell him that Mary's baby, that, that she's obviously pregnant with, is, has been conceived by the Spirit. And then Matthew says, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. Uh, Matthew picks up on this um, this promise here to hit home a few points. Mary was a virgin, uh, but most importantly, that Jesus is God with us. And that Jesus, in the rest of the gospel we see, is the only Israelite who can follow God faithfully, who does what his father wants, and whose heart is not hard. And so when you place your faith in Jesus, when you put him in the driver's seat of your Uber, uh, you are unified with him. His death and resurrection pay for your hard-heartedness. And you two are now counted amongst the faithful. And the Holy Spirit changes your heart, changes your heart so that you want to follow God. You actually desire to have him uh, in charge of your life. You desire to trust him with everything that you do. So back to our question, who is in charge of your life? And how are they going? This morning, Isaiah is pointing us to the one who we should put our faith in, the one who we should trust with our lives. And, and not just because he's God who's in control of everything and can see everything and knows everything, as good as those things are, but because of who he is, the God who has sacrificed his one and only son to you so that you might know him and trust him. God calls Ahaz and he calls us uh, to put your faith in him because then you will stand in this life and the next with him. And that faith is possible because Jesus has died and risen. And so place your faith in him not as just some figurehead that you remember once a week, that you turn to when things are hard, but as someone who you genuinely trust and who you genuinely want to you to lead your life. So this morning, friends, if you haven't placed your life in the hands of the God who loves you, I want to encourage you to think about that, to do something about that. Uh, chat to someone uh, here at church if you're with us physically this morning or over Zoom. Um, chat to someone over the phone. Take time to see if what Jesus says is true. And through that, you see why God is the one who you should entrust your life. And if you already are a follower of Jesus, I hope that this has been an encouragement because it's not just a once-off, I place my trust um, in God and that's it. It's a daily retrust, a daily putting your life in God's hands. 
and it's hard. You often just find yourself taking over, doing what you want. But let us be reminded of who God is and how much he loves us because he is gracious and we can come back to him even when we fail. Ahaz had a choice and today you have a choice. Who are you going to trust with your life? God's call is to place your trust in him because he's shown us in his son how much he cares for us. I'm going to pray for us that we all might place our lives in the safest hands, those of our heavenly father. Great God, loving father, you have loved us so immensely in the Lord Jesus that you have given up your own son so that we might know you. Father, help us to entrust our lives uh, to you, knowing that you love us, you want the best for us, uh, and that you care deeply for us. Uh, Father, we um, confess the times when we've not done uh, what you've asked, where we've sought to rule our own lives. Uh, Father, we know that you are a forgiving God, and so we ask for your forgiveness. Uh, Father, we ask that you might help us through your spirit to entrust our lives to you daily. And we ask these things in the name of the risen and reigning Lord Jesus. Amen.